The video you are about to watch is from an old woodworking magazine that I published during the years of 2003 to approximately 2006. This was a very unique magazine. It was purely video content and it was distributed on DVDs. The magazine ran for approximately three and a half years and then uh, due to financial concerns we simply had to terminate the magazine. We moved on to other things over the last roughly 15 years. However, there has been a request to resurrect this content, so I've gone through the trouble to get the equipment, the products, everything I needed in order to bring this content back to life to share with everyone. Here on this YouTube channel, we'll be putting up approximately 100 to 120 of the original stories that appeared in that magazine. The magazine was called Woodworking at Home Magazine, and it was truly one of a kind in the world. I really hope you enjoy these videos, and please tell your friends about them. Well, according to that, it's time to talk about our mantle project. Now, as you can see, we've got two different clocks here, but essentially they're the same physical shape clocks. This particular one is maple with bloodwood inlays and Wenge soundport covers. This clock is bloodwood, maple inlays, and Wenge soundport covers. Now, you can, of course, use any species of wood that you would like, whatever fits your fancy. This particular clock has a quartz movement in it. This one has a mechanical movement in it. So at some point, should you decide you want to start out with the quartz movement and then upgrade to the mechanical movement later on, you can do that. The clock will accommodate both movements and will provide sourcing uh, information for the different movements and so forth. Now I would like to point out that the joinery on this uh, project is rather involved. There's an awful lot of tongue and groove joinery going on as well as some sliding dovetails. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about that type of joinery. Other than that, the clock is, as you can see, a very attractive piece and it would be a great addition to any home. So let's jump back a little bit in time and show you how we made these. While it's certainly possible to construct this clock out of any woods that you'd like, I myself have chosen some nice contrasting woods. Now throughout the construction of this, you'll see that we're building two different clocks. One will be primarily out of bloodwood, the other will be primarily out of maple. Now I do have three species of wood, hard maple that's highly figured, wenge or wenge, and bloodwood. Bloodwood is a very dark redwood, it's very finely textured. It looks very similar to Paduk, but it isn't open grained or open poured like Paduk. It's much more finely textured. It's a very hard, dense wood as well, and it's used in flooring applications. But the three woods look very good together for me. The hard part, and this is where cutting diagrams can be a rather large problem when working from project plans like we provide. Now, if we were to just cut apart this board following a cutting diagram, without regard to figure, grain pattern, coloring, and so forth, the end result would never really be as good as if you take your time and find the areas of each board that really look the best. Put those on the most visible components of your project. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm going through, selecting all the different materials, the different textures, uh, the grain patterns and so forth, trying to find the best looking pieces to see where I can put those on the clock in the finished project. Once I get my selection set up, then I'll start uh, rough cutting some of the boards down into smaller components. And at that stage, then I'll go through and plane the material to thickness. Now we will be working with many different thicknesses of wood, quarter inch, five sixteenths, and five eighths. So I do have to, of course, plane all this stock down to the appropriate thickness. So your planer is going to get a workout on this project. Now if your planer does cause sniping at the beginning or the end of the cut, uh, at the end or the beginning of the board, be sure to allow for that in, in your rough cuts so that you have enough material there where you can trim away the snipe. 
So I'm going to probably spend about another hour here trying to figure out which area of which board I want to be featured on each of the pieces of the clock. Then we'll start rough cutting it and planing it. Planing the boards is just a matter of running them through, taking about a 30 second with each pass. I'll take as many cuts as necessary to get the material down to its appropriate thickness. Over here at the joiner, all I really have to do is make sure that my fence is square to the table and I use a square to make that adjustment. Now I've got my uh, depth of cut set at about a 32nd of an inch. I'd rather take several light passes than one heavy pass because that would create a greater tendency for tear out. Next what I want to do is rip my board so that both edges are parallel to each other. So I need to find the narrow point and it happens to be right here at about 10 and 5 16 of an inch. Now once I finish this ripping operation I'll have these two edges parallel to each other. Now what I need to do is break down this piece in length. Here's my two side top pieces and this area over here will be my center top piece. Now I've got a line down the middle here about where I want to cut it and this would be a rough cut but you'll notice that my saw isn't wide enough to cut completely across in one pass. And I'll show you a little trick where this laser guide comes in handy. Now at this point you can see that the cut ended about here. Because both faces are parallel to each other, I'm going to flip it over, line up my previous cut with my laser marks, and finish up the cut. And as you can see I've got a fairly straight cut, not bad for a roughing operation. Now with the jointed edge against the face, I'll go ahead and rip my components to their proper width. Now back here at the compound miter saw, we can cut off the component to its proper overall length and of course square up the two end cuts to our two edge cuts. Then we'll have a nice square piece for which to do the rest of our machining operations. And now our stock is plain to thickness, ripped to width, and cut to length as well as being square and flat. And that sets the basis for all the future machining operations. Now that we've got all of our components milled to thickness and cut to size, it's time to turn our attention to the joinery. Now this is going to be a rather long involved process because we have to do some of the joinery here at the router table, some of it with a straight edge guide and a handheld router, some of it sliding dovetails, some of its dados, some of its grooves. So we're actually going to be bouncing back and forth quite a bit. Now you can of course do some of this with your handheld router or you may be able to do most of it here at the router table. If you've got a miter gauge or a miter gauge slot on your router table that gives you a little added advantage because you can help guide the work pieces a little more safely. And we don't have one so that's why we're going to show you the different techniques between handheld routing and doing some of these machining operations here at the router table. Now for our first cuts we're going to start out with the two side top pieces and we need to machine a sliding dovetail socket. Now we have to have that a certain distance over from the edge and we'll have to very carefully measure that. The router bit has to be raised up to a very exacting height, in this case 5 16 of an inch. And we don't have or we don't want the slot to continue all the way through. So we'll have to affix a stop of some sort so that we can feed up to that stop and then retract the workpiece, leaving a blind or a stopped dovetail socket. So let's bring you in a little closer and we'll show you the first few setups. Now I started out by installing a half inch dovetailing bit in my router table. I've raised it up 5 16 of an inch. With it unplugged I of course spin it around and then I can measure off the face of my fence. Now of course our dimensions for the dovetail slots are relative to the center line. So we have to either subtract a quarter inch or add a quarter inch to get the distance between the fence and the edge of the router bit. And of course I'll have to make that adjustment for each of the cuts. Now again routers unplugged so I'll spin my router bit around so that the flutes are in this direction and we have to make a stop cut. So I can bring my workpiece up into contact with the leading edge of the router bit. I can then measure back how far in I want to cut, in this case 3 and 7 eighths, and I will clamp a stop at this point. And then that way I can feed my workpiece up to that stop and then retract the workpiece very carefully keeping it tight against the fence. 
And I like to work with a nice long stop, as in this case, rather than say a short narrow stop that's way back here. Because as I feed in, I may want to overfeed and that could allow the workpiece to cock around like that. By using a nice wide stop block that is square to the fence, I can feed up to it and there's no chance for that workpiece to want to twist or cock around on me. Now I know that when I'm cutting along like this, the chips are going to be flung forward up against where my stop is. So I've placed a piece of wood underneath my stop so that way when I'm feeding in and the chips are flying in that direction, they'll go underneath the stop and not prevent my workpiece from contacting the stop. Now one of the problems with working with small components like this is holding them while you feed them in. Now the last thing in the world you really want to do is try and feed this small of a piece by hand. Your fingers are just too close to that router bit to be safe. And that's where I'll be using my gripper block. Now I will have to be careful here as I feed this in that I make sure that the front edge of my gripper is behind the front edge of my workpiece. Now as I mentioned before, we're going to need to make mirror image components for left and right pieces on our clock. Now when we machined this slot, we were up against the fence. The fence was all the way over here and that created a nice stable cutting environment. However, for our next piece, we need to create the mirror image. So the slot will start at this edge and come in. So in order to do that on the router table, we would have to be this far away between the router bit and the fence. And that gives us a great opportunity to have the workpiece twist on us during this cut. So we have to look at some other options for doing that slot. So let's head over to the workbench. Now here we've got the same scenario again. We've got our slot that we've machined over at the router table. And in this case, to machine that one here on the workbench, we could use a clamp-on straight edge guide. And that would work out fine. But on this particular board, that slot will be right in this area. And there's no way to clamp on a straight edge guide. Because we would be actually overhanging like so. Now you might think, well, let's just put our guide on this side of the work. And then we'll bring our router bit in in this fashion. Well, that's possible, but it's not really the safest thing because the router is going to want to try to self-feed against that fence and it could pull itself in through the cut. So we've come up with another solution and it's in the form of a jig. Now this particular jig, we're going to show you how to make it in another segment in this issue. But what it allows you to do is easily load your workpiece in to this jig. It has a nice tool guide on this side that is square to the fence so it's very easy to set up and all you'd need to do is measure your distance from the fence to where you want your slot to be machined set that workpiece position and then guide your router along so to see how this jig is made head on over to our our jig story and you'll get a full explanation on how to make and use this jig now with all the dovetail slots cut, we can turn our attention to the dovetail itself. Now when we machine that, we'll be using the same router bit with the same height setting. And of course we'll have to adjust our fence in and out to get the width of that dovetail just right. And You should do that on a piece of scrap stock of the exact same thickness. Once I get the width set just right on the dovetail, of course I'll check it against the fit inside of our slot. But it's just a matter of running the board over, spin it around, pass it over a second time. Now the last step for our sliding dovetail is to cut away a quarter inch back on the front edge of each of these dovetails and that's so that it can slide into that round ended dovetail slot. Now I've raised up my saw blade to a quarter of an inch and set a stop block to five sixteenths of an inch and then that way I can nibble away that front edge of that material very easily here at the table saw. Now with all of our dovetail joinery done and out of the way, we can turn our attention to all of the grooves and dados that we need to machine. To get started on the dados, I'll be working on the base of the clock. And on this base, we need four 3 8 inch wide by 3 8 inch deep dados machined in it. Our jig is going to work out wonderfully for this operation. It's just a matter of making the cut and indexing the workpiece along. Now I'll be using my larger router this time and I've got a 3 8 inch router bit installed in it 
Back here at the router table, I've installed a quarter inch diameter router bit. I've raised it up an eighth of an inch. I've also set up my stop block, and what I want to do is start machining the grooves that will go on our side top panels. Now once I get the router bit height set and my stop set, I'm in pretty good shape to machine all four of those grooves. The only adjustment I'll have to make is the fence position so that I can get the front groove and then the back groove. Now as I've mentioned before, these are mirror image components, so we'll have to using the dimensions on the drawing, calculate the position of our grooves relative to the opposite side. So it's very easy to do by measuring our existing part, making our fence adjustments. And then that way we can start off the end of the board and then feed in. If we went with the same fence position, we'd have to drop down on top of our groove and then feed off. And that can be a little bit tricky. Now our case sides need a groove that runs all the way from top to bottom. It's not a stop cut. So that means that we can just leave the fence in position and run both pieces through, left and right, without any adjustments. We don't need a stop because this is a through groove. Another fence adjustment and another cut. Moving on to our internal dividers now, what we need to have is a groove three and a half inches in from the edge on the clockwork side that runs clean from the top all the way towards the bottom. Now on the right side divider, we need the groove to run from the bottom all the way up to that sliding dovetail socket we machined before. And again, that dimension is three and a half inches. So in this case, I'll feed from the bottom all the way up, and then I've set my stop so that I'm stopping right in my dovetail slot. Now for the left side of the clock, we could do like we did before, recalculate the position and adjust the fence. However, I'm going to show you how to make a starting cut in a slot like this so that we don't have to adjust the fence. Now as you can see, I've put a piece of tape here on my fence, and what I'm going to do is just drop my workpiece over the router bit and then feel where that router bit is. Now of course, we don't want to make a cut up in here because that's exposed. So what I'm going to do is slide it forward and then I'll lift up while keeping it somewhat stationary front to back and I'll make a mark. Now I should be able to just drop this part down at that point and then feed across and off the end of the workpiece. Now to help with this type of operation, I'm using a gripper system and I'm using that stabilizer plate and it has the hook on the back. And that allows me to catch the workpiece or tramp it completely against the fence. It also allows me to push back against the workpiece and somewhat hold it in my gripper. So now I can carefully come over my mark, drop down, and then feed across. After yet another fence adjustment, we're ready to make that next cut. And again, you can see how we've got our mirror image pieces. Now for the bottom panel, we need some more grooves cut in it, and we'll of course have to make a stop cut in one end of the board. Now if you've got a router with a, a fence attachment, you can machine very easily this type of cutting operation. However, here at the router table, we'll follow the same procedure we did before. We'll just hook our gripper underneath the back end, drop it down, feed across. And that, of course, worked out very nicely. Now we just need to make a fence adjustment to cut our front slot. And that finishes up our grooves and slots for the base of the clock. Now our center top piece has a groove along the front edge, and that'll hold the clock dial mount, and that one's an eighth of an inch deep. We'll follow, because it is stopped, we'll follow the same procedure we did before. Now for the groove that runs along the back edge, we need to bring our router bit up to a 5 16 cut depth. And that gives us the clearance to get our back panel in and out of the clock body. For that back groove, we need it 5 16 of an inch wide, so we'll have to take it in two passes. So my first fence position will be 3 16 of an inch.
Now we move our fence back away from the router bit a sixteenth of an inch. And that'll give us a five sixteenths inch wide groove. Now the reason why we do it this way, if we were to move the fence closer at this point, and we're only taking a partial cut, remember our router bit is rotating this way. So if we started feeding in, it's going to want to pull our workpiece through, creating a self-feed situation. By moving the fence away from the router bit, we're cutting on the side of the router bit nearest to you, so that would create a situation where the cutting forces is pushing back towards you so that you can feed into it and the router bit won't try to pull the workpiece along. And now we've got our grooves machined on our center top piece. What I'm doing now is marking the leading and trailing edges of my router bit. And that will help us when we cut these slots into our sound ports. Now on top of the workpiece that we're about to machine, and these are the two side front panels, we need to machine a couple of through grooves, grooves that go all the way through. And those let sound from the chimes come out of the clock. Now what I want to do is come down on that mark, feed across, stop the router, and then I'll remove the piece. And that'll create that slot. Now I've got my marks two inches in from each end. Now I'd like to also point out that our horizontal positioning of these slots we're showing on the drawing as relative to the center line. So make sure you adjust your fence accordingly. One slot out of the way, all I have to do is spin it around and I can machine the other slot. The position of those two mounting slots that we need to machine have to be perfectly in line with each other. If they're cocked at all like so, our front piece is going to be twisted on the front as well. So I've gone through, marked on the edge of my board, where I want the start and the end to be for each of those two slots. So I'll bring my layout marks lining up here with the trailing edge of my router bit. I'll make a mark here, feed over, make a mark here. And that'll show me where to make the slot that'll go in this location. Now I'll bring it over to this point where the slot will be in this location. I'll make a mark here, bring it up, and I'll make another mark here. So I'll have to actually make two stop cuts where we drop down, feed across, pull up, drop down, feed across, and pull up. And now for the second cut. And we've got our two grooves. What I'm doing now is marking out the same locations the same way I did for our side front panels. But this particular piece will be used for our sound port covers, and the material is Wenge. Now you'll notice that this piece seems rather long, especially relative to our side front panels. Now, I left it long intentionally. There's actually two pieces here. I've yet to cut them apart. There's about a three-quarter inch gap here in the middle. And that just gives me a bigger piece to hold on to while we're making these cuts. And as you can see, we've got our grooves in there nice and neat. Now later on, of course, we'll finish up the machining on this component. At the bottom end of our dividers and side panels, we need to have a 3 8 inch wide by quarter inch high tongue machined on the end of them. So we'll have to make some rabbit cuts on both faces. To do that, I've reinstalled my routering fence. I've installed a 3 quarter inch white side router bit, raised it up an eighth of an inch, and exposed a quarter of an inch of it away from the fence. Now I can just simply pass the board over on each face, and that will give me the tongue. With a slight adjustment in the fence and router bit height, I'm now set to machine the rabbit that goes all the way around the perimeter of our clock dial board, and that allows it to fit inside that quarter inch groove that's in the top, bottom, and the two divider panels. And that gives us a nice rabbit all the way around. For the sides and dividers, we needed to notch away the front edge of our dovetail. We need to do the same thing on the front edge of our tenon, or our tongue. Same setup, just a slight adjustment in our stop position, and just nibble away at the material. With all of the primary joinery now done and out of the way, I've gone through and assembled everything, making sure everything fits up good. 
Now we can turn our attention to some of the decorative elements, and that will be that edge banding that we're going to place around the top three pieces and along the edges of the bottom piece. We'll do that over at the table saw. While this operation certainly could be done over at the router table with a quarter inch or even a three eighths inch router bit, I find that my stacked dado head cutter gives me a nice clean uh, groove or dado wherever I need it. Now the setup is very simple. I've got an eighth inch between the edge of my blade and the fence and the stacked dado head cutter, which is a quarter of an inch, is raised up an eighth of an inch. Now I'll have to pass the board through twice, once with each face against the fence, and that will make sure that this groove is nice and centered. Now the other thing that you have to notice on this particular setup is my zero clearance throat insert plate. If I was using the stock uh, dadoing insert, my workpiece would probably fit right into the groove and pass down inside the table saw, and that would create obviously a very dangerous situation. So making up a zero clearance insert plate is not only for your regular saw blades, but also for your dado blades. Now the only real tricky part on this operation are these end cuts on that little extension piece that goes on the front of our base. Now because it's about the same length as our top is, what I'm going to do is just line up one edge very carefully, and then I'll tape these two pieces together and pass them through at the same time on it. Now the tape is only there to help hold the two pieces together so they don't fall apart while we're feeding them through. Now the gripper is actually what's giving me a nice amount of control over that workpiece as I feed it over the stacked data head cutter. To help with aligning and attaching that small extension that goes on the front of the base, we're going to use the groove that we've already machined. We just need to machine a matching tongue on the back edge of that extension. Now to do that, I've left my quarter inch stacked dado head cutter in the table saw. I've installed my rabbiting fence, which has a cutout so that I can cover up part of that saw blade. I've exposed an eighth inch of it and still have my saw blade raised up at an eighth of an inch. I can pass the board through, clip it in for end, and pass it through a second time. And that will give me the tongue that I need to fit in that groove. And that fits in the groove nice. We're ready to move on. Before I assemble our base extension to the base, I do want to get the edges sanded up real nice along the front edge of the base and on the ends of our extension, because we won't be able to sand those up later. So I'll get a little bit of sanding done and then we can glue these pieces together. When I cut away my base extension from the main portion, I made a witness mark on one side and then along the center line. And that helps me with getting everything lined back up again as we glue these pieces back together. And while this sits in the clamps and dries, I'll go about doing some detail sanding on the rest of the components. The banding that I use on the maple clock will be bloodwood. It looks very good against the maple. Now I'm also making a bloodwood clock, so I'll be using some maple for that edge banding. Now when I'm ripping it, I've got my rip fence set at a quarter inch, and my blade set just above the stock. I'm using my gripper with the quarter inch leg against the fence and that allows me to pass right over the blade and make the operation nice and safe and with this forest woodworker 2 saw blade I'm getting just beautiful cuts on here so I don't even have to joint between each of the cuts. Well I'd say that's a real good fit. What I've done is readjusted my rip fence so that it's 3 8 inch with the cut, checked it for fit, now I'm ready to rip the strips again so that they're 3 8 of an inch wide to fit in those grooves. Now I am using two grippers for this feeding operation so that I can do a hand over hand operation and that makes sure that I keep the stock tight against the fence and in control at all times. We'll start out by mitering the corners over at the table saw. Then we'll start fitting them together and cutting them to length. Of course some ends will be mitered and other ends will just simply be a nice square cut. All the cutoff work I'll do at the table saw with my miter gauge. When making your first few cuts on a fresh piece that you're starting out with a square end, don't just try and cut off about a quarter of an inch of it, because generally that excess piece is going to fly away. I like to start out by just nibbling away the end, taking a series of cuts until I've got my full 45 degree bevel on there. Now if you're more comfortable doing cutoff work here at your compound miter saw, when working with small stock like this, 
I find that it works out very good to clamp on an auxiliary wooden strip first, then cut through it, and that'll give you your exact position of where your workpiece is going to be cut at. Now you can line your layout mark up with that kerf line. And by having this gap very narrow like this, there's less chance of the small cutoff pieces from being sucked into the saw blade. And now with our inlay pieces all cut to size, we can start gluing them in. Now this is uh, an exotic wood, this blood wood, and it does have quite a bit of oil in it. So anytime you're gluing together exotic woods like this, it's a good idea to wipe off the pieces first with acetone. And that will remove a lot of the surface oils and create a better bond with the adhesives. Now I'll just start applying some glue. I'm going to use it rather sparingly. I don't want to deal with a lot of glue squeeze out. That'll just create a lot more work for me. And now we can just start installing each of the pieces. I am going to put a dab of glue on each of the miters to help hold those together. And now we'll use some tape and clamps where possible to hold everything together till the glue sets up. The two center dividers of the clock need to have a large cutout in them. This cutout is for clearance of the chime rods for the mechanical clockwork. Now on the drawing you'll see that we've got it drawn as a sharp corner. However, I like to put a, a radius in these inside corners like this whenever possible because having a sharp corner in this fashion creates a stress point right here. By drilling a hole and creating a radius here that relieves that stress point. So we'll start out over at the drill press and drill a half inch hole at these two locations first. Now I'll finish up the cutout with the bandsaw. Now of course if you have a jigsaw or even a scroll saw, those would be fine tools to do this operation. Now our next step for the center dividers is to re-rip them so that our edge banding is flush with the front edge of the center divider itself. I'm getting ready now to cut out the profile for our sound port covers. Now the first thing I need is a 20 inch radius and that will go along the outside edges. So what I want to do is make a template. So I'm just going to scribe on my piece of cardboard a 20 inch radius and then I'll need another one that's a 5 inch radius. Now I'll just very carefully cut along my layout mark. Now with a piece of cardboard squared up and cut to the overall size of our sound port cover, I'll transfer these radii onto that piece of cardboard. and This will create our master template. As I mentioned before, the material I'm making my sound port covers out of is Wenge. It's nearly black, so drawing a pencil line on there is going to be rather invisible. So I'm just putting masking tape on there to give me something a little bit better to draw on. Now you certainly could cut out this pattern over at the bandsaw or even with the jigsaw, but the scroll saw just seems to make the most sense for this type of intricate cutting. A couple of minutes with the oscillating spindle sander and we can further refine its shape. We need some small tenons to mount our sound port covers. Now I'll be starting out with some quarter inch thick maple and I'm going to rip it to a 3 8 inch wide strip. Now to cut off the pieces to their one inch overall length, I'm using my miter gauge here at the bandsaw. And I've got a stop block set up so that I can take a series of cuts and get all the pieces at a one inch length. And over here at the belt sander, I can quickly round over the ends. Now with all the major joinery out of the way, our next step is assembly. And now is the best time to go through and finish sand and detail everything out. Now we need to lay out the location for all the holes that we have to drill in our dial board. Now I've got a nice template that came with the clock that makes it very easy. All I had to do was draw a center line on my clock to find the center for the hand shaft hole and then I just made a center line down the vertical axes of the dial board, placed my template on there, and now I can just take my scratch all and mark the location of each of the three winding holes. 
The location of each of these holes has to be fairly precise, so take your time, line everything up, and then clamp your work securely to the table before drilling the hole. Now with the clock movement resting on top of my dial board, what I want to do is center up each of the winding shafts on the holes that we drilled earlier. So you have to look up underneath the work, move it around until everything looks good and centered. Then I'll mark the hole locations for our mounting screws so that we've got that out of the way before assembly. Using a 1 16th inch drill bit, I'll drill the pilot holes for the mounting screws. Now before you do your assembly, make sure you go through and do a couple of dry assemblies. It will save you an awful lot of grief as we go through this process. Now I'll be starting out assembling my dividers to the side tops and the side pieces. I'm using liquid hide glue because it affords me a little bit more assembly time. Now the back panels on the sides and the front panels on the side areas just need a little glue in the center of each of our grooves to help keep the panels from rattling. And of course make sure because everything's upside down Make sure that you get your backs in your back and your fronts in your front. Now you'll notice that of course I'm building this clock upside down. Helps work out a little bit better when assembling all these sliding dovetail joints. And now for our clock dial board. Again a little bit of glue in that dado. Now when you assemble your clock dial into the case, make sure that up is up and down is down. Otherwise you're going to have real big problems mounting that clock up later on. And now for a little bit of glue on the ends of each of our tenons where they go into the base and then we can bring that piece in. The styles and rails for the door start out with some blank stock that's three quarters of an inch thick, about two inches wide, and the overall length I've cut to the exact nine inches long. Now I cut them wide to help uh, minimize the chances of tear out when we do these machining operations on the ends because we can always cut it off when we rip them to their proper width. Now one board will be making the styles out of, the other board will be making the rails out of. Now I've already gone through, cut it to length, ripped it oversize and width, and now what we want to do is machine the groove on the end of the board that will accept the tenon for the mating component. I've already set up my stack dado head cutter. It's a quarter inch wide, raised up three quarters of an inch, and I set the distance from the inside face of my dado blade to the surface on my tenoning jig to exactly a quarter of an inch. Now we just need to make those cuts. Now we need to cut our tenon on the ends of our rails. Now this is actually going to take two steps. Our first step is to make the shoulder cut, the cross grain cut. I've raised up my standard saw blade a quarter of an inch and I've set the distance from my stop to the left edge, my point of view, of my kerf line at three quarters of an inch. And that will establish my three quarter inch tenon length. Now to finish up our tenoning cut, I've set the distance from the far edge of the blade to the face of my tenoning jig at a half of an inch to remove that outside face and then I've raised up my saw blade three quarters of an inch. As you can see, I did get a little bit of tear out there. Generally, it's much worse than that. However, we did plan for it, so it's not a problem in this case. Along the back edge of our rails, we need to cut a quarter inch deep by 3 16 inch wide rabbit. To machine that, I've installed a 3 8 inch diameter solid carbide spiral router bit. And it's a white side router bit and it works very well for this type of operation. I've exposed a 3 16 of an inch from, it, from the fence, raised it up a quarter of an inch, and now we're ready to cut. Now on the rails, we can actually start off the piece and feed all the way off the other end. For the styles, we need to make stop cuts. For the styles, we need to make a stop cut. So I'll mark the starting point and the ending point of where I want to feed my style to.
Now along the back edge of one of the styles, we need to create a little recess in there, a rounded recess to create a finger pull to open the door. To, use, to do that, I'm using a white side, part number 1374, a router bit. It's got a nice curve at the top and it's actually a bull bit, but it gives me the radius that I'm looking for. On the front face of the rail, I've marked the starting and ending points of where I want my finger notch to be. Now I've got my router bit installed, so I'll just kind of line up about that mark for where I'll plunge in and make my start. Up to about there. And that'll be my ending cut. And I'll plunge it in and cut it just like I did for the rabbit. Now the last step before assembly on our door is to cut the grooves that will receive the inlay. And those grooves go on the styles. To machine them, I'm using a quarter inch stack dado head cutter, raised up an eighth of an inch, and set an eighth inch away from my rip fence. Now I'll have to make that cut in two passes, going in each direction, and then we'll have our half inch wide groove. Now before assembling the door components, take your time to sand up the inside faces of each of the four pieces. It'll save you a lot of grief later on. And now we can go ahead and glue everything together. Just using yellow woodworking glue for this part of the assembly because I know it'll go pretty fast. Then clamp up your frame with a light touch and check it for square. You don't want this door to be out of square. A moment or two with a good sharp chisel and we can square up these corners easily. To hinge our door, I'm using these barrel hinges. They're 10 millimeters in diameter and you can pick them up at your local woodworking store. Now they do require very precise drilling on the location of the holes, so take your time doing the layout. Now I followed the manufacturer's suggestions as to how far to put it in from the outside edge of the door. Now our door is such that we've got a 16th inch gap at the top and the bottom. So I'm using a 16th inch shim on the bottom of my door and I've taken the time to transfer my hole locations onto the side style where the hinges will be. Now what I can do is just slide my door over and then transfer those marks from here onto the front of our divider where the hinge has to be drilled in in that location. And again I'll have to measure from the edge to the center position matching up the edge to the center position on the door style. Using a 10 millimeter brad point bit, very carefully line it up with your layout mark. Then clamp your workpiece in place and drill the hole half the length of your barrel hinge. And then we'll just follow the same procedure to drill the holes in the clock case. To hold our little door closed, I'll be using these rare earth magnets. The particular size that I have are 5 16 in diameter. Now because of our finger pull on the back of our door style, we need to position it either above or below it. So I'm going just below it, and I've transferred my hole location over to the side, and we'll drill the hole in the same process we did for the hinge holes. And with all the machining done on our door, we can install our inlays. The access panel for the back of our clock needs to have a hole drilled in it, and that allows you to get your finger in there to pull it out. It's centrally located left to right, an inch and an eighth down from the top. And I'm using a one inch diameter Forstner bit, as that seems to be about the right size for a finger hole. Well, before we start finishing, now's the time to pay attention to all those little details. I'm going to go through, check to make sure everything's sanded up proper before we go on to finishing. For my finish, I'm using a spray-on lacquer. Comes in these little aerosol cans. Works out real good. Application couldn't be easier. Just take the necessary precautions. It is lacquer, which means it's very explosive. With the finishing out of the way, we can turn our attention to installing the hinges. To get them installed, I find that it works best to get them into the case first, and if you start them in the hole with the hinge open, you can get them squared up a little bit nicer. Then just close it up and drive it in. Then place the door on the two hinges, 
put a protective covering on, a block of wood, and then tap the door down flush. And that works out real good. Now if your hinges are a little bit loose in the hole, tighten up the little set screws and those will expand the barrels. Using some 5 minute epoxy, I can get that down in the hole where we're going to place our magnet. And seeing as how I'm already working with some epoxy, I'll just use that to glue the sound port covers in place. The glass for my door I picked up at the local hardware store. I just told them I wanted single strength glass, told them what size to cut it, and they did all the hard work for me. Now all we need to do is uh, install it in our door. Now with small doors like this I've tried to use some of those uh, push-in clips and so forth and I've found them to be actually quite troublesome. For a small door I've found that silicone adhesive is one nice product and all you need to do is put a little dab in each of the four corners and that'll hold the glass in there nice and secure. Choosing a clock dial is a challenge for any designer. Now I did come across the company called Clock Prints. It's run by a lady, Gay White, and she just does a remarkable job of designing a wide variety of clock prints. Now you can purchase these directly from her, and from what I understand, clock kits up in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin will also be carrying some of her prints now. And we'll put some information up on the screen at the end of this story so that you can purchase the clock print that fits your tastes. Whether you're working with a quartz movement or a mechanical movement, we need to punch some holes in our dial. Now the first one that you'll want to punch is your hand shaft hole. And then that way if you're working on a mechanical movement, you can place the dial over your uh, mounting board, trace the other hole locations on the back side, and then punch those out. To punch it, I'm using a hollow punch. Now if you don't have hollow punches, which are mechanics use these for creating gaskets for car parts, uh, if you don't have a hollow punch, you can also pick up some of that uh, small gauge brass tubing that you can find in some of the hardware stores. Then it's just a matter of lining it up, tapping it with a hammer, and you've got your punched hole. Now the maple clock is going to be our quartz movement clock. And a final assembly is very easy on this step. Now I've inserted my quartz movement. Now we can bring our clock print into position. And then we'll have a washer and a brass nut. Now to help hold our clock dial flat and against our backing, I'm going to install these two little retaining strips. They're 1 8 inch thick, ripped to width and cut to length and finished like everything else. Now, should I want to change this dial at a later date, I want to be able to get these clips off, so I'm just going to put a very small dab of glue on each one to help hold them in place. And the last thing to do is to install the hands. Install the mechanical movement by first installing the movement into the clock, tightening up your four screws. Then install your hands and set them according to the instructions that came with the movement. Now our next step is to install the chime rods and getting this aligned in the case does take some fiddling. Now you will have to make a riser block to bring the chime rods up into the appropriate height so that the hammers can hit them appropriately. So there is going to be some adjustment as far as the dimensions and so forth that we've given you on this chime rod riser block. Then you'll have to drill a hole through the case bottom and then tighten up the screw and we're using a number eight by one inch long wood screw. Well, that concludes our mantle clock project. Now keep in mind, you can either make it with the quartz movement or the mechanical movement. And if you do decide to go with the quartz movement to start out with, you can always upgrade it to the mechanical movement later on. I'm Chris Dayhut for Woodworking at Home Magazine. Thanks for watching. I sincerely hope you enjoyed watching this video. If you truly enjoyed it, please help us share this information with the rest of the communities. Please hit the subscribe button, give us a big thumbs up, and be sure to tell your friends about this channel. Thanks again for watching.